So um, I was asked initially by uh, BRE to come along today and just give you a bit of an update on what we're doing within um, a group called uh, BIM for Housing. So this is just a sort of a speed, speed, speed dating tour. Talk, talk a little bit about what, what BIM for Housing is, why it was created, how it was created, how it's the membership, uh, what its objectives are. A little bit on the construction strategy from the government, though we've heard some of that already today, so I won't go too much in, in detail. And then probably most importantly, a few case studies. Now, I'm no expert in, in, in BIM. Um, one of our speakers, um, one of the, the people involved in the group is a guy called Richard Whitaker from Nottingham City Homes. And what I like about him is he, 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 he says it as it is. He said, I'm not really interested in all the technical data and Kobe and BIM level two and all this sort of stuff. He said, all I'm interested in is what it does for me as a client. And I think that's really what we've been listening to this morning, that we, we, we need to understand what anything that we're talking about does for the end user client. That's the important thing. So, um, so what, what, why were we created? Well, BIM, Building Information Modeling, is, it's widely seen by the construction industry as the, as the answer, answer to greater efficiency and improvements. Um, Department of Business Innovation and Skills set up something called BIM for Communities about four years ago now. Uh, but not unusually, the house building sector was a little bit slow on the uptake. Some house builders are beginning to dip their toe in the water, and I'll give you some examples of the, some of the successes a bit later on. But most are taking a cautious approach. So as a sector, housing needs to catch up. Um, and we were put in place to try and accelerate the adoption of, um, uh, of BIM. Um, how? Well, it actually coincided the launch with a, a Structural Timber Association BIM conference I was holding for my members back in January at the BRE. So, so lots of synergies there. Um, and since then, uh, the group has, has grown, uh, meets every quarter, set of conferences from, from autumn last year through to summer of this. Um, and now we've got over 100 people uh, interested in participating in the forum. In fact, I think we had a we had a meeting yesterday, and I think it now totals 138 different organisations interested. So, must be having an impact in terms of uh, interest within the housing sector at last. But the passion and drive has really come from a, a small steering group and the people in, involved in the conferences, plus the help of a guy called David Philp, who many of you will know, um, in, in the Binford communities. And resource comes from another organisation I'm involved with, Constructing Excellence, because when I, when I was asked to take on the chairmanship of Binford Housing, I, I was told, we'd like you to do it, but there's absolutely no resource. There's a surprise, and I don't think things are going to change. So anything we do within the industry, we have to do it. And I don't have a problem with that. I actually think that it's sensible that we understand the business benefits of what we're doing, and if we value what we're doing, then we, then, then we pay for it. I don't have a problem with that philosophy. Uh, and what we're about to launch um, <coughs> at the end of the year is, is a how-to guide so that people in the housing sector who want to look at whether that be social housing or private housing, if they want to have a look at BIM for the first time, can actually go through a process, a uh, bit of a Janet and John guide, really. Um, in terms of membership, um, we have a steering group, which is uh, made up, as you can see, I won't go through it in detail, but private developers, affordable housing, um, warranty insurance designers, uh, contractors, I represent the um, specialists with, with my Structural Timber Association hat on, and um, SIG from the supply chain. So, And um, it's made up of the whole supply chain. Because the, the bottom line with off-site, with BIM, with all these things is you need a collaborative approach, you need an integrated supply chain. You can't do it really in, in, in isolation successfully. And I know when Stuart Delgano gets up on his feet very shortly, and I think you're going to talk about AIMC4, and that's the same message, isn't it, coming out loud and clear. Um, so private affordable housing, uh, steering groups I've mentioned. Um, and these are the objectives of the group. So this is what we set out to do. So we want to identify areas where there's unresolved development and then try and find a, um, uh, a solution. We want to liaise with other BIM organisations, not just in the UK. And I've got a case study in a minute showing you some results from, from Norway, they're about five years ahead of us in the housing sector over there. Liaise with other organisations here in the UK. Particularly, we're working with BIM for FM, because when you're a housing association, the FM benefits come out loud and clear. Uh, working with BIM for manufacturing, because a lot of what we do uh, is relevant with them. So, 
Um, there's, there's some other groups within the BIM4 community that we work very closely with to build this evidence-based case studies, which is the Janet and John guide I referred to earlier, to spread knowledge and awareness of BIM standards of information and so on, hence the, the conferences that we did, and then encourage all parties to work collaboratively using you know, BIM as the vehicle, if you like. Because the two things that BIM does for you, as far as we're concerned, is it promotes a collaborative culture and it promotes a lean approach to, to processes. Um, we touched on this today, so I won't, I won't go it in, in detail, but the, um, we've got the, the, the construction strategy that was launched four, four years ago, so targets to reduce capital cost and, and carbon burden, although with, with the latter maybe the foot's been taken off the accelerator. Um, and the idea was by 2016, um, all government-funded projects should be at level two BIM. doesn't apply to housing, disappointingly. We've got the HCA on our group, and they're not enforcing the use of BIM, which we feel is disappointing. We are putting pressure on the guys from the HCA to re re reassess that. Um, and, and Business Innovation Skills launched their strategy um, a year later. In terms of the HCA, they are very, very supportive of what we're doing. Um, obviously, the drive to reduce 20% costs is, is, is key. And, and whilst they're not mandating it, they are, as you can see from the bullet points, consulting with partners and in, in terms of the attitude to take up BIM. They're collating and sharing case studies, and I've got one coming up for you. They're hosting events. They're supporting me on BIM for Housing. So they're there in everything but mandatory format at, at, at the moment. This is one case study that you can find on their website. Um, so this is a project in Birmingham, um, Access Design, Mion Gro Grove. Um, what they're saying is, well, you can read the... the can you read them from the back? Because um, I'm not a great fan of going through lists when they're up on the screen. But um, So what they say is, BIM model assisted with project team understanding of a complex site, increased clarity of information for public consultation, reduced risk for the tenderers, clashes were prevented, modelling scheduling, scheduling outputs assisted the contractor, and early modelling of information meant that interval between the planning and site was reduced. So those are the, those are the advantages. The drawback was that initial cost, um, the people cost of training and the software cost, and, and, and the lesson was use, use BIM from the outset. So that's, that's just one case. So that's, why, that's why the HCA are keen to support it, but they're not going as far yet to make it mandatory. I've just put some figures up here. This came from another presentation um, from another um, presenter on one of our conferences but if if fm is is a key a value to you if it, if it, if, it, if it's something that plays as an important role so again the social housing is, a, is an example um, if you can see the figures down the left hand side so the first one is faulty fan so traditionally it takes four weeks if you look at the bim fm it takes a day so the man hour saving was was 11 and the inconvenience saving was 27 days so 11 hours, 27 days. Those are the sorts of savings that BIM has been found to achieve uh, from an FM model. And it goes down the same. Let's take the lamp replacement next one on. Normally, traditionally, it took six weeks. With the BIM FM model, it took a day, eight hours man saving, five weeks, six days of inconvenience. So we can go right through that list, but you... you we, we've, we've found that without any doubt, one of the major savings in the BIM for housing arena in particular um, is, is, is the significant savings on the uh, facilities management. This is the, the Norway um, presentation. I've, I've picked a few slides out of the various presentations that we've had. Um, and this is, this is interesting. So in, 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 in Norway, um, they do BIM. If you want to build houses in in Norway, they, they do it in BIM. There's no questions asked. And they see it as this. This is how they describe it. It's open, shared information uh, based on open international standards. It's about effective collaboration, better project results. That's important. Building smart. We've heard about that. Um, and an opportunity to make more money. And with the current climate, with the current government, um, I think that bottom bullet point is where we need to focus our attention. Because if we go with all these weasel words about how good it is for this, that, and everything else, it isn't going to get much traction. 
But if we can promote the business benefits of what we're trying to promote, then I think we have more chance of making it stick. And, and I, I believe that the, 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 those that have adopted BIM to date within the housing sector are finding those business uh, benefits. So the last point they say, though, is it is an enabler to make BIM work. You need to change your processes. Um, they then go on to say it's the opposite to conventional building projects where there's errors in procurement, errors in drawings and so on and so on. We, we exceed deadlines. Where have we had all this before? I, I was involved in the change agenda for nearly 20 years. This was all the same as what Latham and Egan were saying in the, in the 90s. And guess what? Nothing's changed. So this is, this is, this is what it's not. So it's those of us that have been involved in the change agenda since the mid-noughties we see BIM potentially as the vehicle that will give us that collaborative culture, that will give us that integrated supply chain and those lean processes that we seek. They have um, a user manual in Norway, and at the moment I'm struggling to find funding um, within BIM for Housing to take that manual and adapt it for use in the UK. I went to the NHBC, but they, they turned me down. So if anyone's got any ideas where I can go next, I'd, I'd be pleased to receive them because I think it's nonsensical to reinvent wheels. If there's something already out there that we can utilise, let's, let's, let's look at it. Let's go through it from a UK perspective and, uh, and, and, and make it um, suitable for our, for our use. But that, that's what they've got in Norway at the moment. Um, so the question is, or they, one of the questions they posed was how to, to increase productivity and profitability through the use of BIM. And as I say, I think this is at the heart of certainly our agenda for the next five years, although now Jeremy Corbyn's in place, it could be 10, 15 or 20 years, I think, um, with, with the Tory government. No, no political sort of uh, persuasion there, but uh, uh, that's just personal view. Um, but all projects are designed in BIM, uh, IFC export to other domains. In some projects, they make complete models. Um, and the BIM quantity takeoff um, was something significant, I've, and I've got a slide on that in a, in, 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 in a second. Um, so the, the success is 20% reduction in build cost, uh, less conflicts, less clashes, better procurement, etc. And uh, they built with this Norgis concept, and they built about 100 um, uh, a couple of years ago doing that. Some of the examples, the, the clash detection is famous. If you speak to people about BIM, the first thing they always say, well, it detects clashes, and it does. Um, and that's one of, the, uh, one of the examples. So here is an example of an exhaust and, and supply air duct misplaced in the wall. The action extending the air ducts to fit in the wall and the profit or correct quantities avoid stops in production on the building site. So the, the, these are things, and there's another example. Similarly, with clash detection, um, with, with, with down lights, um, you, you can read it, as I say, as well as as well as I, and another clash detection. So, yeah, clash detection is, is one of the key advantages. It's one of the key benefits um, um, which, which, which BIM can help with. But the point they make here is that actually BIM embraces the whole process of design, manufacture, and construct, and then through to asset management. And as I say, if you, if, if, if you do that in Norway, then if you're going to build houses in Norway, then that's what you get. So this is their learning. This is what they say they've learned from their five-year path. So we need to start with the owners, well, we need the clients, if you like. There's no, no, no surprise there. Need to motivate government. Not sure we can do that. Um, it's, it's possible today, they say, and most importantly, it's profitable. They do this because they make more money using BIM. But the change in the business process is, is the key. Uh, focus on knowledge and education and so on. Um, just a few slides now with a few more examples of, of some of the benefits. This is um, PRP architects uh, who um, do a lot of social housing. They were doing something called Lonely BIM. Um, they were doing it on their own for ages. Uh, I think others have, have caught up now. This was, this was um, how they measured performance. Um, this was targeting their resource for a project using BIM. Uh, that was the actual resource they used, so you can see it got slightly delayed. But when you put the figures together, 
those are the two lines. So the blue line was the target. The brown line or the yellow line was actually the resource they used. And there is the, the BIM gain, as they've called it. So that was the saving to them as a business in terms of BIM. And that's why people are using it, because it's good for business. It's good for the individual business. It's good for the project and the supply chain. And indeed, it's good for the client. Um, another uh, slide, I've just, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but just to give you another example of what people are using BIM for. So Weights are looking to have a series of uh, standard products. And they're working with, particularly with um, SIG, uh, uh, to, to, to look at this. But they, they want a standard kit of parts for all their, for all their houses, for all their, for all their homes. Um, Telford Homes, love the guy from Telford Homes. A uh, guy called uh, Mark Duffield, um, Cockney boy. And, and again, tells it like Richard does from Nottingham, you know, tells it as it is. And one of the things I've brought here is, is the scheduling. Because he came with a real case study of a project in Hackney. And he said they'd save 20% on material costs through accurate scheduling where the schedule and the bricks and so on that they'd actually ordered was exactly what they wanted. They didn't have the waste. And, you know, it's just common sense. But that was, for, for many people in the room, a real eye-opener. 20% saving on the first job in material waste. He also saved 20%, by the way, on design. Um, and the other thing that... Um, the, other, the other story he tells, which is, um, which is good, is, is the way his marketing department used BIM. A lot, a lot of the clients that they have are in Asia. So they were able to take the, the, the BIM models. So there's, there's, there's your Revit model. And they actually put one of these uh, machines up in the, uh, what are they called? Dr Dr yeah. And, and they film um, the, 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 the area around where they're going to build. And they put that actual film into the, into the model. And they send this across to the Asian client and sold every unit without them, the client having to leave the country. And, and these are the sort of um, uh, benefits. Just going back to, um, to Richard, who I mentioned from Nottingham City Council, one of the stories he tells is where they have a planning meeting and the planners don't like something they've drawn. And normally speaking, he said, we'd have to go away and come back next month with an update. He said, all we do is we go around, we fiddle, fiddle, fiddle. And he says, we come back, so you mean this? And they've saved a month. And these are the advantages that some people don't think about. But as I said, I've been very fortunate to listen to these case studies uh, through 12 conferences. And it, it, it's just common sense, you know. The one thing I would say, though, it takes a leap of faith. I've mentioned Rich, Richard Whitaker of Nottingham City Homes. I've mentioned Mark Duffield of, of, of Telford. And, and all the case studies, it takes a leap of faith. It takes someone to believe that this is the right thing to do. It takes leadership. All the cases I've talked about are people that are prepared to put their chin out and say, we're going to do this because I believe it's right. And, do you know, I was in, a, in my BIM for housing meeting yesterday afternoon and, and there were a lot of people around. Well, we can't do that because, because, because. And do you know what we lack as an industry? We lack leadership, in my opinion. We lack people that have got that true passion to say, we're going that way. That's the right thing to do. And you come and follow me. And we need more leaders a lot of what we're talking about today, this is just a, a small element of what we're talking about today, but it's the same throughout our construction industry, in my view. It needs more leaders to stand up and be counted. Um, but above everything else, it's about having a collaborative culture because we won't achieve all the benefits we've been aspiring to achieve this morning. We certainly won't achieve the benefits in BIM or the other thing I talk about regularly in off-site construction if we don't have a collaborative culture and if we don't have an integrated supply chain. I've been trying to achieve it for 20 years and I've had a modicum of, of success in some areas and then the wheels came off in 2008. But there's a real opportunity now and my sort of saying um, this, this year is sort of uh, I've, I've, I've been using Carpe Diem um, seize the day and this sort of saying that the opportunity of a lifetime needs to be grasped in the lifetime of the opportunity and I really do think that's now we've got we've got this huge increase in business that's on our horizon and we've got this huge skills shortage and there's all sorts of good stuff going on to improve the image of construction and get more people in but hey we need them now the only way we're going to do that is to be more productive more efficient more effective 
with what we've got, the resources we've got. And I think BIM will play a huge part in that. So thank you for that.